beloved viewers, you are most welcome to our channel Poetry Online. In this video, we shall be discussing the detailed analysis of Telephone Conversation by Wallace Oyinka. Kindly subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon to get updates on all our new videos. Once again, let us assure you of a very interesting discussion. Get ready for this lesson. Aki Wande Oluwole Wole Soyenka was born on 13th July 1934. He is a Nigerian writer, poet, and playwright. He won the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1986, the first African to be honored so. In 1994, he was designated UNESCO Goodwill Ambassador for the Promotion of African Culture, Human Rights, Freedom of Expression, Media, and Communication. And today, we're going to study his poem, Telephone Conversation. Let's start by reading the poem. The price seemed reasonable. Location indifferent. The landlady saw she lived off premises. Nothing remained but self-confession. Madam, I warned. I hate a wasted journey. I am African. Silence. Silence transmission of treasured good reading. Voice when it came. Lipstick corset. Long gold roll cigarette holder pipe. Caught eye was folly. How dark. I had not misheard. Are you light or very dark? But some B. But some A. Stench of racist breath of public hide and seek. Red boot. Red pillar box, red double tie omnibus culting tab. It was real, shamed by ill mannered silence. Surrender pushed and found her to bear simplification. Considerate she was, varying the emphasis. Are you dark or very light? Revelation came. You mean like plain or mock chocolates? Her accent was clinical. Crashing in this light impersonality. Rapidly, wavelength adjusted. I chose West African savior. And as after thought, down in my passport, silence for spectroscopic flight of fancy. Till truthfulness clung her accent, hard on the mouthpiece. What's that? Conceding. Don't know what that is. Like brunette. That's dark, isn't it? Not altogether. Facially, I am brunette. But madam, you should see the rest of me. Palm of my hand, sole of my feet, are peroxide blonde. Friction, caused foolishly, madam, by sitting down, has turned my bottom raven black. One moment, madam. Sensing her receiver rearing on the tender clock about my ears. Madam, I pleaded, wouldn't you rather see for yourself? After reading the poem for the first time, what can we say about the narrator and landlady's nationality, their skin colors, manners, intelligence, vocabulary, and power? The landlady that the narrator hasn't seen. All he knows about her, he learns from her voice. Find a quotation that tells us what he imagines about her appearance. What can we learn from the landlady from this quotation? So, let's take a summary of the poem Telephone Conversation. Telephone Conversation is a poetic satire against the widespread racism prevalent in modern Western society. As the title suggests, the point depicts a telephone conversation between a West African man and a British landlady who shockingly changes her attitude toward the man soon after he revealed his racial identity. The poem begins on a peaceful note, befitting the narrator's satisfaction for having found the right house. The price seemed reasonable, location indifferent. The landlady also emphatically mentioned that she lived off premises, thereby ensuring that Tenants will enjoy absolute privacy and freedom. The conversation, however, drifted to an unpleasant turn of events soon after the man, surprisingly, decided to make a self-confession to reveal his nationality. Madam, I warned, 
I hate a Western journey. I am African. A sudden unexpected silence followed, and the awkward pause in the conversation is strengthened by Caesra, trying to emphasize the impact of the Africans' race being revealed to the landlady. An uneasy atmosphere is created here, and the word silence betrays a sudden change in the landlady's attitude as well as the man's intuitive sensitivity towards the unfriendliness on the other end of the telephone. Silence. Silence transmission of pressured good breeding. It seems as if the narrator was caught in a foul act, and the expression, pressured good breeding, is only an ironical manifestation of the polite manners the landlady was supposed to have for the job of renting premises. After a considerable period of silence, when the landlady spoke again, her words seemed to come from between lipstick coated lips that held between them a long gold roll cigarette holder, and the impression she gave off was that, as if her social status in the society was all of a sudden upgraded by knowing that the man is an African. Undoubtedly, the poor's power of imagination enables him to visualize an affluent and sophisticated British landlady belonging to the so-called progressive and urban world on the other side of the telephone. Tension rises with the explicit racial discrimination conveyed through the question, how dark? The landlady's effort in seeking clarification is something quite irrelevant. That is, her skin color in the course of the conversation is emphasized. She repeated her question, reinforcing the racist overtone in the English society. The lady's pushy and equivocal stance in pursuing the answer rendered the man speechless. He suddenly seemed confounded. Button B, button A. The automation imagery shows the man's temporary conclusion and implies the rampant discrimination taken for granted in the Western society. Short changes to disbelief that transform itself quickly into shared disgust and utter indignation. Red booth, red pillar box, red double tied omnibus curtain tab. The narrator is jolted back into reality from his trance-like state, and he makes a frantic attempt to ascertain the situation. The revelation comes to the repetition of the question by the landlady and the varying emphasis. Are you dark or very light? You mean like plain or milk chocolate? It was so shattering to the narrator that the landlady could be so insensitive to his feelings, fuming with anger. The man decided to inflict similar humiliation on the racist woman, choosing a superior vocabulary and replying in an acutely sarcastic tone. He quickly forces her into submission and exposes the ignorance of the landlady, clearly illustrating that beneath the lady's glossy and lavish exterior, she was just a shallow judgmental racist. Paying no attention to the lady's disrespect for him, he took a firm control over the conversation defending the dignity and integrity of his ethnic identity from the ruthless onslaught of the landlady. He goes on to describe the various colors one could see on him. Facially, I am brunette, but madam, you should see the rest of me. And vast, he goes on to state that the palm of his hand and the sole of his feet are peroxide blonde, but friction by sitting down has turned his bottom raven black. With a slow but furious realization, the landlady began to set the receiver down. The man rushed to ask sarcastically, Madam, I pleaded, wouldn't you rather see for yourself? The quasi-politeness of the tone of the poet can hardly conceive the ultimate insult inflicted on the landlady and shows how indignant the man was, also ending the poem with a tremendous sense of humor. Apart from the obvious sarcasm, Telephone conversation is a favorite, both for its excellent use of rich language and the timeless message it conveys. That is to avoid silent resignation to such policies of racist society and also that intellectual superiority is not determined by racial color. Let's take a detailed analysis of the lines contained in the poem. The price seemed reasonable. Location indifferent. The landlady saw she lived off premises. Nothing remained but self-confession. Madam, I warned. 
I hate the Western Jenny. I am African. Silence. Silence transmission of fresh good breeding. Voice when it came. Lipstick corset. Long gold roll cigarette holder pipe. Caught eye was folly. The speaker of the poem, a dark West African man, searching for a new apartment, tells a story of a telephone conversation he made to a potential landlady. Instead of discussing price, location, amenities, and other information significant to the apartment, they discuss the speaker's skin color. The landlady is described as a polite, well-bred woman, even though she is shown to be shallowly racist. The speaker is described as being genuinely apologetic for his skin color, even though he has no reason to be sorry for something which he was born with and something he has no control over. In this short poem, we can see that the speaker is an intelligent person by his use of high diction and quick wit, not the savage that the landlady assumes he is because of his skin color. All these discrepancies between what appears to be and what really is creates a sense of verbal irony that helps the poem to display the ridiculousness in racism. The price seems reasonable, location indifferent. The first sentence of the poem includes a pun that introduces the theme of the following poem and also informs us that things are not going to be as straightforward as they appear. The price seems reasonable, location indifferent. If we read over these lines quickly, we will assume that the speaker means being neither good or bad by the use of the word indifferent. But indifferent is also defined as characterized by lack of partiality or unbiased. The other definition gives the sentence an entirely different meaning. Instead of the apartment's location being neither good or bad, we read the apartment's location as unbiased and impartial. However, we quickly learn in the following lines of the poem that the location of the apartment is the exact opposite of unbiased and impartial. The speaker is really denied the ability to rent the property because of bias towards the skin color. The opening pun quickly draws our attention and suggests that we as readers be on the lookout for more subtle uses of language that will alter the meaning of the poem. Caught eye was fouling. After this introduction, the speaker begins his self-confession about his skin color. It is ironic that this is called a self-confession since the speaker has done nothing that shows that he should confess for his sins since he has done nothing wrong. He warns the landlady that he is African instead of just informing her that I am an African. Again, the word court connotes that some wrong had been done, that the speaker was a criminal caused committing his crime, making the speaker actually seem sorry for his skin color. By making the speaker actually seem sorry for his skin color, Wally Soyenka shows how ridiculous it is for someone to apologize for his race. To modern Western thinkers, it seems almost comical that anyone should be so submissive when he has committed no wrongdoing. Let's continue with our analysis. How dark? I had not misheard. Are you light or very dark? But some B, but some A. Stench of racist breath of public hide and seek. Red booth. Red pillar box. Red double tire omnibus culting tab. It was real. Shamed by ill managed silence. Surrender pushed and found her to best simplification. Considering she was, varying the emphasis. Are you dark or very light? Revelation came. You mean like plain or milk chocolate? Her goodness is seemingly confirmed later on when the speaker says that she was considerate in rephrasing her question. Her response to the caller's question included only light or impersonality. Although she was described as being a wealthy woman, she was seemingly considerate and only slightly impersonal. The speaker seemed almost grateful for her demeanor. Of course, 
This kind of description of the woman are seeming with verbal irony. We know that she is being very shallowly judgmental, even when she is seeming to be so pleasant. The speaker mentions her good breeding, lipstick coated lips, long gold rose cigarette holder, all possessions that should make her a respectable lady. These words, describing her wealth, are neutral in regards to her personal character, but allows that she could be a good person. How dark? After recording the all-important question, how dark, the poem pauses for a moment and describes the surrounding to give a sense of reality that shows that the ridiculous question had really been asked. The speaker describes the buttons in the telephone booth, the foul smell that seems to always coexist with public spaces, and the bus driving by outside. His description gives us an image of where the speaker is located, a public phone booth, probably somewhere in the United Kingdom. The red booth, red pillar box, and red double-tired omnibus are all things that one might find in Leeds, the British city which Wallace Soyenka had been studying prior to writing this poem. In addition to the literal images this description creates, a sense of anger running through the speaker's mind is portrayed by the repeated use of the word dread. This technique is the closest that the speaker ever comes to openly show anger in the poem. Although it is hidden with seemingly polite language, a glimpse of the speaker's anger appears in a quick pause in the conversation. In the end, the landlady repeats a question, and the speaker is forced to reveal how dark he is. West African savior, he says, citing his passport. She claims not to know what he means. She wants a quantifiable expression of his darkness. His response, feigning simplicity, is that his face is brunette, his hands and feet are peroxide blonde, and his bottom raven black. He knows that she just wants to measure his overall skin color so that she can categorize him, but he refuses to give it to her. Instead, he gives details of the different colors of the different parts of his body. Wouldn't you rather see for yourself? Let's continue with our analysis. Her accent was clinical, crashing in this light in personality. Rapidly, wavelength adjusted. I chose West African savior. And as after thought, down in my passport, silence for spectroscopic flight of fancy. Till truthfulness clung her accent. Hard on the mouthpiece. What's that? Conceding. Don't know what that is. Like brunette. That's dark, isn't it? Not altogether. Facially, I am brunette. But madam, you should see the rest of me. Palm of my hand. Sole of my feet. Are peroxide blonde. Friction. Caused foolishly. Madam, by sitting down, has turned my bottom raven black. One moment, madam, sensing her receiver rearing on the tender clock about my ears. Madam, I pleaded, wouldn't you rather see for yourself? As suspected, or as it was meant to be, this greatly annoys the landlady, and she hangs up on him, enclosing. He has a then empty telephone line. Wouldn't you rather see for yourself? The speaker still playing his ignorance of what the landlady was truly really asking. Sounds as though he was asking whether the landlady would like to meet him in person to judge his skin color for herself. The irony in this question, though, lies in the fact that we know that the speaker is actually referring to his black bottom when he asks the woman if she wants to see it for himself. Still feigning politeness, the speaker offers to show his backside to the racist landlady. Throughout the poem, yes, another form of irony is created by the speaker's use of high diction, which shows his education. Although the landlady refuses to rent the apartment to him because of his African heritage and the supposed savagery that accompanies it, the speaker is clearly a well educated individual. Words like pipe, Rancid and spectroscopic are not words that a savage brand will have in his vocabulary. 
The speaker's intelligence is further shown through his use of sarcasm and wit in response to the landlady's questions. Although he pretends politeness the entire time, he includes tactile meaning in the speech. The fact that a black man could outweigh and make a white woman seem foolish shows the irony in judging people based on their skin color. Wallace Oyinka's telephone conversation is packed with subtle ties. The puns, irony, and sarcasm employed helps him to show the ridiculousness of racism. The conversation we observe is comical, as is the entire notion that a man can be judged based on the color of his skin. So, let's now consider the ways the narrator won and the ways the narrator lost. The narrator won in the following ways. 1. He stayed polite. He showed that he was well-educated. He used words that the landlady did not understand. He proved that the landlady was hypocritical. He made jokes at the expense of the landlady, made her to be the one to lose her temper. Where's the narrator lost? The narrator did not get the apartment. He was made to feel guilty for being black. He felt angry at the landlady's racist question. He was a victim of racist comments. And the most disturbing part of it all was that he couldn't change the view of the landlady. Let's consider the following quotations. Off-premises, what does this say about the landlady's involvement? Self-confession, think about the negative connotation of this word. African, what does this tell us about Wallace Oyinka? Why does he not just use obvious and direct words? Pressurized. How genuine is a landlady's good reading after reading the poem? Thanks for watching this video. Please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and share this video.